I have been reading the psychotherapy supplement to A Course of Miracles. This is like maybe the sixth or the seventh video that I that I'm I'm doing on this subject. Um, I'm, I've been reading through it, and it's it's a little bit long. I've been going through it paragraph by paragraph, and right now we are towards the end of the middle section. So the supplement is called Psychotherapy Purpose, Process, and Practice. And the middle section is the process section. Right now we are on section six, which is called the definition of healing. Let's read the just the end of section five for a moment, which is the process of healing. You would um, think that Jesus would have started with the definition of healing, but but he didn't. But here's the end paragraph of that previous section. It says, let us stand silently before God's will and do what it has chosen that we do. There is one way alone by which we come to where all dreams began. And it is there that we will lay them down to come away in peace forever. Hear a brother call for help and answer him. It will be God to whom you answer for you called on him. There is no other way to hear his voice. There is no other way to seek his son. There is no other way to find yourself. Holy is healing, for the Son of God returns to heaven through its kind embrace. For healing tells him in the voice for God that all his sins have been forgiven him. All right, so that's how that ends. Healing tells him that all his sins have been forgiven him. So now we're on section six, the definition of healing. Uh, I'm going to read this. This is seven paragraphs, and then I'm going to go through it paragraph by paragraph. The process, of psycho the process of psychotherapy, then, can be defined simply as forgiveness, for no healing can be anything else. The unforgiving are sick, believing they are unforgiven. The hanging on to guilt, it's hugging close and sheltering. It's loving protection and alert defense. All this is but the grim refusal to forgive. God may not enter here, the sick repeat, over and over, while they mourn their loss and yet rejoice in it. Healing occurs as a patient begins to hear the dirge he sings and questions its validity. Until he hears it, he cannot understand that it is he who sings it to himself. To hear it is the first step in recovery. To question it must then become his choice. Paragraph two, there is a tendency and it is very strong to hear the song of death only an instant and then dismiss it uncorrected. These fleeting awarenesses represent the many opportunities given us literally, quote, to change our tune, unquote. The sound of healing can be heard instead, but first the willingness to question the, quote, truth, unquote, of the song of condemnation must arise. The strange distortions woven in inextricably into the self-concept itself but a pseudo-creation, make this ugly sound seem truly beautiful. Quote, the rhythm of the universe, unquote. Quote, the herald angel's song, unquote. All these and more are heard instead of loud, discordant shrieks. Paragraph three. The ear translates, it does not hear. The eye reproduces, it does not see. Their task is to make agreeable whatever is called on, however disagreeable it may be. They answer the decisions of the mind, reproducing its desires and translating them into acceptable and pleasant forms. Sometimes the thought behind the form breaks through, but only very briefly, and the mind grows fearful and begins to doubt its sanity. Yet it will not permit its slaves to change the forms they look upon, the sounds they hear. These are its, quote, remedies, unquote, its, quote, safeguards, unquote, from insanity. Paragraph four. These testimonies which the senses, senses bring have but one purpose, to justify attack and thus keep unforgiven, unforgiveness recognized for what it is. Seen undisguised, it is intolerable. Without protection, it could not endure. Here is all sickness cherished, but without the recognition that this is so. For when an unforgiveness is not recognized, the form it takes seems to be something else. And now it is the, quote, something else, unquote, that seems to terrify. But it is not the, quote, something else, unquote, that can be healed. 
It is not sick and needs no remedy. To concentrate your healing efforts here is but futility. Who can cure what cannot be sick and make it well? Paragraph 5. Sickness takes many forms, and so does unforgiveness. The forms of one but reproduce the forms of the other, for they are the same illusion. So closely is one translated into the other that a careful study of the form a sickness takes will point quite clearly to the form of unforgiveness that it represents. Yet seeing this will not affect a cure. That is achieved by only one recognition, that only forgiveness heals an unforgiveness, and only an unforgiveness can possibly give rise to sickness of any kind. Paragraph 6. This realization is the final goal of psychotherapy. How is it reached? The therapist sees in the patient all that he has not forgiven in himself and is thus given another chance to look at it, open it to reevaluation and forgive it. When this occurs, he sees his sins as gone into a past that is no longer here. Until he does this, he must think of evil as besetting him here and now. The patient is his screen for the projection of his sins, enabling him to let them go. Let him retain one spot of sin in what he looks upon, and his release is partial and will not be sure. Paragraph 7. No one is healed alone. This is the joyous song salvation sings to all who hear its voice. This statement cannot be too often remembered by all who see themselves as therapist. therapists. Their patients can but be seen as the bringers of forgiveness, for it is they who come to demonstrate their sinlessness to eyes that still believe that sin is there to look upon. Yet will the proof of sinlessness seen in the patient and accepted in the therapist offer the mind of both a covenant in which they meet and join are, and are as one. Full stop right there. Um, what I'm getting is you know that the course, Jesus says over and over again in the course, that this course is aiming at a complete reversal of thought. It's the course is coming to, to help you reverse the thinking of the world, which is the ego's thought system. And the world is based upon the ego's thought system. So this is aiming at a complete thought reversal. And what I'm seeing here which I didn't see before. When I read this before, I, I really only read this supplement once before. Um, what What is the subtext? You know, for, for the Course in Miracles, you have to think in terms of context and subtext. Now, some people who read A Course in Miracles literally, word for word, literally, it means what it says, I think are denying that there may be a subtext, meaning that there is a deeper layer of what is being said beyond the literal, right? Now, I believe that what the subtext here is, is that Jesus is saying, the, the therapist thinks that they're the therapist and the patient is the patient and the patient needs them. The patient needs the therapist, but no. <laughs> the therapist actually needs the patient, right? Because the, Because the therapist is also their mind is not completely healed. And so this is a, in a way, this is a cautionary tale. This is saying that you who think you're a therapist, you who think you're a teacher, think again. You are also the patient and you are also the student. You may be, you, you may be a little bit further along in terms of, you know, having worked with the Course of Miracles. Maybe you think you're, you know, your mind is close to being healed, or maybe you think you're close to enlightenment, or maybe, <laughs> but, but the reality is, is that you still believe in sin, you still have un unforgiveness that you have not addressed, and the patient or the student, in this case, it's the patient, is there to bring the mirror to you to show you that your mind is not healed yet. And that's true of every encounter that we have. Every encounter in life, as Jesus says, it can be a holy, a holy encounter. It is a holy encounter in the sense that every situation, every person that you meet, every situation you're in is a way to find yourself again and is a way to forgive. It's bringing you 
the mirror to look at your own unforgiveness and to recognize it. So let's read this paragraph by paragraph. Paragraph one, the process of psychotherapy then can be defined simply as forgiveness for no healing can be anything else. Healing is forgiveness. The unforgiving are sick, believing they are unforgiven. Now, this again, this is, is making it that it's all in your mind, right? And, and forgiveness and unforgiveness are in your mind. The unforgiving are sick, believing they are unforgiven. The hanging on to guilt, it's hugging close and sheltering. It's loving protection and alert defense. All this is but the grim refusal to forgive. God may not enter here, the sick repeat over and over, while they mourn their loss and yet rejoice in it. They mourn their loss and, and yet rejoice in it. So they, you know, when, when you're sick, you don't realize that you, on some level, you want to be sick. Sickness is a choice. You, are, you want to be sick because you cannot, you, you cannot bear the, uh, and you're threatened, you feel threatened by the alternative. The alternative really is not scary and, and the alternative really is not threatening, but you think it is, your ego thinks it is. And so sickness becomes what you turn to. And on some level, you, you do rejoice in it, even though you also don't wanna be sick. <laughs> but it means that you, you know, you're, you're safe from that cruel dictator God, you know, who's going to get you, who's going to punish you for, for separation. I mean, that's all, that's what it all goes back to ontologically speaking, uh, metaphysically speaking. Healing occurs as a patient begins to hear the dirge means the sad, mournful tune that he sings and questions its validity. Until he hears it, he cannot understand that it is he who sings it to himself. To hear it is the first step in recovery. To question it must then become his choice. So we hear, you know, I, I don't know where it's from. Maybe the 12 steps is that the first step is to not be in denial, <laughs> right? You have to realize that you're singing this, you're singing this tune and it's you that's doing it, right? And to realize that you're the one that's singing it is the first step, to not be in denial. Paragraph two, there is a tendency and is very strong to hear the song of death only an instant and then dismiss it uncorrected. So you, you may recognize it for a moment, but then you just say, no, that's not, it's not me, it's something else, you know? I put the blame outside of myself on, on, the, on something external to me. These fleeting awarenesses represent the many opportunities given us literally to change our tune, quote unquote, to change our tune. <laughs> the sound of healing can be heard instead. But first the willingness, <clears throat> now when Jesus says literally to change our tune, he, does, he doesn't mean, he doesn't mean literally, literally, because we're not singing a song. <laughs> This is where, if you read this literally, you might say, yeah, we are singing this song and we have to recognize that we're singing this dirge and no, that's not what it's saying. It's, this is poetic, right? Putting it poetically and this is kind of a, a play on words Jesus is making, you know, the, this gives you a chance to literally change your tune. <laughs> um, the sound of healing can be heard instead, but first the willingness to question the quote, truth unquote, of the song of condemnation must arise. Meaning that, that dirge, that mournful tune that you're singing is, is, is your unforgiveness, right? You've condemned your brother on whatever level you've condemned your brother. And that is your choice to, to, to do that, right? That is your tune that you're singing. And it is reflected back to you by your brother. The strange distortions woven inextricably into the self-concept, itself but a pseudo-creation, make this ugly sound seem truly beautiful. 
the rhythm of the universe, the herald angel's song, all these and more are heard instead of the loud, of loud discordant shrieks. So you're, you're fooling yourself. You think, you think your song is a happy one, this song of condemnation, this song of unforgiveness. You think it's beautiful because you're so scared to let it go and, and to recognize what it really is, it's the ego. It's the discordant, loud discordant shrieks of the ego that you're following. The ear translates, it does not hear. The eye reproduces, it does not see. Their task is to make agreeable whatever is called on, however disagreeable it may be. They answer the decisions of the mind, reproducing its, de its desires and translating them into acceptable and pleasant forms. Sometimes the thought behind the form breaks through, but only very briefly, and the mind grows fearful and begins to doubt its sanity. Yet it will not permit its slaves to change the forms they look upon, the sounds they hear. These are its remedies, quote, quote unquote, remedies, its quote unquote, safeguards from insanity. So we see and hear what we want to see and hear. And we... Again, this is just, Jesus is just going, taking paragraph two and, and expanding upon it and saying, this song of our mind, which is the song of unforgiveness and song of condemnation, a very mournful song, we, because we are not ready to see that, see it for what it is, we, our mind translates it into or we can, you could say we rationalize it to be something good as opposed to something for what it really is, you know, what, what it really is, which is condemning ourself and our brother, unforgiveness of ourself and our brother. Four, these testimonies which the senses bring have but one purpose, to justify attack and thus keep unforgiveness unrecognized for what it is. Seen undisguised, it is intolerable. So if we really saw the ego for what it was, this is the point that Jesus makes in the text of the Course. If we really saw the ego for what it was, we could easily dismiss it. But the ego is hidden. Right? That's, that's the illusion. The, the ego is very clever in how it tricks us into thinking that, that it's something we want. But in reality, it's if we saw it for really for what it what for what it is, we would not want it. So, seen undisguised, it is intolerable. The ego would be intolerable. Without protection, it could not endure. Here is all sickness cherished, but without the recognition that this is so. For when an unforgiveness is not recognized, the form it takes seems to be something else. And now it is this quote something else that seems to terrify, but it is not the quote something else that can be healed. It is not sick and needs no remedy. To concentrate your healing efforts here is but futility. Who can cure what cannot be sick and make it well? As, for, as an example, there's sickness and, you know, our body appears to be sick. And we make, and they, so we, we make the body into the problem. We make the body into you know, something's wrong with the body, but we don't, we don't allow ourselves to recognize that, no, ultimately, it is our mind. Our, our body will only follow, the body will follow, um, the body is a wholly neutral thing, and all bodies are whole, wholly neutral things, and the world is really a neutral thing. It is the, the meaning that we, that we give to it, and there's only two possible meanings. There's the ego's meaning, and there's the Holy Spirit's purpose or meaning. The only thing is, is that the ego's meaning is meaningless and purposeless, purposeless, whereas the Holy Spirit's meaning and purpose is true. <clears throat> so we push it outside of ourselves, right? We, we, we push the problem outside of it. We say, no, it's not in our mind. It can't be in our mind. We can't be the cause of our problems. <laughs> Something else has to be the cause. We are just the victim. We are, are just the, um, you know, the innocent bystander in all of this. Things are being done to us. We're not doing them. Our mind can't possibly be the, the one who is choosing this.
Paragraph six. Okay. Um, paragraph five. Sickness takes many forms, and so does unforgiveness. The forms of one but, but reproduce the forms of the other, for they are the same illusion. Right? Unforgiveness and sickness are the same illusion. So closely is one translated into the other that a careful study of the form a sickness takes will point quite clearly to the form of unforgiveness that it represents. A careful study, right? Then if you, if you really study the sickness, you will understand the unforgiveness that lies behind that sickness. Yet seeing this will not affect a cure. This is, that is achieved by only one recognition that only forgiveness heals an unforgiveness and only an unforgiveness can possibly give rise to sickness of any kind. So the, the, the cure to be affected can only be affected through replacing the unforgiveness with forgiveness. And keep in mind that forgiveness itself is illusory and everything here is illusory. But forgiveness, Jesus says, is the one illusion that will lead you um, lead you to the place beyond all illusions, right? Lead you back home to the love, which is your true nature. So you need forgiveness to, to completely heal, right? To, to, to arrive at a completely healed mind, a completely healed mind will then recognize it's one with, with spirit and ultimately return home to the love of God. Paragraph six, this realization is the final goal of psychotherapy. How is it reached? How can you get to this? How can you get to this realization? It's interesting that Jesus used, uses the realization. I, you know, the, the word realization or recognition. Only forgiveness heals an unforgiveness and only an unforgiveness can possibly give rise to sickness of any kind. So how do you get to this realization? The therapist sees in the patient all that he has not forgiven in himself and is thus given another chance to look at it, open it to reevaluation and forgive it. When this occurs, he sees his sins as gone into a past that is no longer here. Until he does this, he must think of evil as besetting him here and now. The patient is his screen for the projection of his sins, enabling him to let them go. Let him retain one spot of sin in what he looks upon and his release is partial and will not be sure. So this is, this is Jesus turning the tables on you who are reading this and saying, you, the therapist, you who are in the position of the therapist, you're the one that really needs the healing and you, you probably are the one who can understand this enough at this point where you really can heal your mind. Perhaps the patient, um, well, I mean, the, the patient will also receive healing, but the patient will receive, the way the patient will receive their own healing is through the therapist seeing no sin or guilt whatsoever in the patient, right? In, in, in the therapist's um, vision, of holiness where the, 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 the therapist does not see any, any blot or sin or guilt or anything in the patient, the patient will, will recognize that themselves. And the therapist through the, through the patient's recognition will, will, will remember that they are also, they are also forgiven. So everyone wins. But I think right now, at least, Jesus is putting the emphasis on the therapist, that the therapist really is the one being healed here. <laughs> right? Surprise, surprise. You know, the, you, you thought that it was the patient, but no, it is you, the therapist. And so it ends, paragraph seven, no one is healed alone. This is the joyous song salvation sings to all who hear its voice. The voice, the capital V, the voice, you know, what I, what I heard yesterday, what I learned yesterday is that it, the Holy Spirit is talking, spoken of in the course as the, the voice for God. Originally, it was the voice of God. 
Um, now, I don't think it really matters um, whether it's the voice for God or the voice of God. But, you know, that's, that's kind of semantics. But the voice here would be the Holy Spirit. So this is the joy of song salvation sings to all who hear it, hear its voice. Or it could be um, the voice just could be the, the um, salvation, you know, whatever salvation would be here. But, but really, it, you know, salvation of, is of, of the Holy Spirit, which is ultimately of God. So you hear the voice, the joyous song of God, the joyous song of spirit. This statement cannot be too often remembered by all who see themselves as therapists. Their patients can but be seen as the bringers of forgiveness. For it is they who come to demonstrate their sinlessness to eyes that still believe that sin is there to look upon. So the therapist is not healed yet. Otherwise, they wouldn't have patience. <laughs> they probably wouldn't be here. Um, but the, the patient is coming to bring forgiveness to the therapist. And I think that's the way Jesus wants us to look at this. It's not, you the therapist are not there to heal anyone. You are there to receive healing. And the way that you receive healing is by seeing your patient, which is your brother, as, as yourself, as the, as the love that you are, completely sinless, completely whole, completely perfect. Their patience can but be seen as the bringers of forgiveness, for it is they who come to demonstrate their sinlessness to eyes that still believe that sin is there to look upon. Yet will the proof of sinlessness seen in the patient and accepted in the therapist offer the mind of both a covenant in which they meet and join and are as one. So the therapist sees in the patient the sinlessness. And in, in seeing that in the patient, the patient recognizes that. And, and in, in their recognition of that, the therapist so too likewise rec recognizes that they are forgiven, that they are without sin. And, and we go home together. No one is healed alone. We, we, go, we go home together or not at all. As Jesus keeps saying, this is all, this course is all about relationship. <clears throat> and we, we, we are healed through our relationships and through seeing, seeing the truth in everything. Whether it's a patient, uh, whether another person, an animal, a person, you know, a person, a thing, a situation, animate or inanimate object, a thought in your mind, something that's going on in your body, whatever it may be, you bring you bring that vision of the Holy Spirit of non-judgment and forgiveness to it. And in doing that, you receive you receive the blessing of, of knowing that you are forgiven. All right. And with that, on that note <laughs> of this beautiful song, we will continue with the last section, probably tomorrow, the ideal patient therapist relationship. And then we're on to the practice of psychotherapy, which will deal more with practical, practical things. Thank you as always for listening i would always love your comments feedback uh if you like the video please please like it subscribe etc you know the, the thing that we that we all say here because we're trying to grow our channels and get get this out to more people this is not um in, in case you didn't know unless you're you know one of the big big shots in the youtube world you're not making money doing this this is a this is a cert a service to the community <clears throat> and um yeah we'd all like to to reach more people and you know my feeling and something jesus is going to go into in at the end of this supplement is that we all it, living in this world we all need to make money you know let's not make money um money is also a neutral thing it's a wholly neutral thing it's neither good nor bad it's not the root of all evil it's just our approach can be egoic or 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 not right 
if we if we approach money in in a egoic way, then then obviously we we're just making it another idol. But if we approach it as a way to bring the love of God to others and to remember that we are forgiven, there's nothing wrong with that. So but let's remember that and not not you know not see money in some other way. So thank you so much and uh, see you soon. Thank you.